The legislative process is complicated and confusing in many ways. No doubt the debate over all the tax issues will take up many twists and turns. So we turn back now to our special line table of former lawmakers for the inside scoop on how many of these issues might play out in the coming days and weeks. As we reflect on this, there's some politics I want to get to. We've heard the speech. We all know what the governor wants to do. But there's some realities, Dan, about how legislating is done. <laughs> Meaning, I want to get to where the roadblocks are on some certain things. And, and I, want to, I want to circle back to uh, taxes and the idea of raising capital. I'm uh, sorry, my fault. Gross receipts taxes right. across the state. This seems to be the one tax that there's some sort of consensus that something might be able to happen. But take us through the reality of the process. Committee, how that works, who, who proposes, who, who, who opposes, so to speak, and how we get to the governor's desk on this. Well, you're going to have, you know, someone's going to draft the legislation and then uh, they're going to introduce the bill. The bill's going to get assigned to the committees. There'll be hearings. One of the interesting things I think we can all agree on when you start talking about raising gross receipts tax is, you know, the only people, the people feeling this financial crisis, it isn't just the state of New Mexico, it's the cities and counties. Right. And they're going to start saying, well, now, wait a minute. If, if you're going to raise it, I need to keep it because we are where the, the rubber meets the road. Sure. So you'll have, you'll have, uh, debate and discussions, you'll have bills amended, you'll probably have some offset where, you know, if, if gross receipts tax drops, because you've got some communities, Rio also, for instance, it was in my district, pretty high gross receipts tax already, and they're a tourist community. If their gross receipts tax goes too high, the thought is people stop coming there to vacation. So you're going to have to have some backstops in there. Once you get it through the House, it's got to go through the Senate. Uh, unlike Washington, D.C., we don't pass bills out of the House and Senate and then have a conference committee, you know, kind of like they do in D.C. where they shut the door and go behind closed doors and decide it. Well, you have to pass the bill through both houses. Then the governor has the right to veto it. Uh, this governor has taken some liberties, good or bad, uh, with line items and things like that that, have, that some people might challenge. And I think you may see even more challenges coming out of this session, um, depending on that. But then you're going to have the final piece of legislation get to his desk. Depending on when he gets it, he has a certain amount of time to act. Um, you know, I, I would tell you right now, the word I'm getting out of Santa Fe is that Republicans in the House have said no, no new taxes. They're not taking any new taxes. They're not going to allow any new taxes. When you raise spending by 41, almost 42 percent over seven years, it's a spending problem, not a tax problem. And they want to see they want to see the administration and the legislative leadership look at true cuts before they start looking at raising taxes on people at a time when people aren't able to afford. I mean, they're getting their homes foreclosed. They don't have jobs. There's a recession out there. The costs keep going up during this time, but the paychecks keep getting smaller. So it's going to be interesting to see how they can bring all of that together. Sure. And Richard, as former Senate President Pro Tem, you've had to corral the kittens, so to speak, for any number of, of issues that are uh, that are difficult. But this one is particularly difficult, isn't it? Because anytime you get in people's pocketbooks, you know, by our system of representative government, folks are going to be letting Senate leadership know, and House leadership, of course, that this is just not terribly popular. How does one work your way through that when you're leading a group of folks like that? Well, I, I think the uh, tax initiatives will start in the House. Okay, know, that's I, true, I, too. I, and, right. I, and, I, and I think that you'll have, the Speaker, I think, will get the votes to pass, say, for example, the gross receipts tax. Uh, right. You know, and, and, we, and we forget the change in the rules, or the, the differences in the rules. In the, in the House, the Speaker is king, mm -hmm. and he will get what there, he wants. There are no rules in yeah. the House. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, just because of the numbers. In the Senate, in the Senate is very difficult. There's sure. a lot more independence. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, really, you know, you, one of the things that I like about the way the Senate is operating now is that they, they do have a, truly a, a committee system where it was really not existing years ago. Sure. So it's actually working. And Senator Smith really is going to hold, uh, you know, the Senate's feet to the fire, so to speak, until they do get some spending cuts. And I think you'll see that. Yeah. But in the end, I think you're going to get a tax increase of some sort along with the spending cuts. The question is, will they do it before the session's over? Right. If they don't, uh, if they're close, my guess is they will have a special session immediately following and go through the weekend. If not, they'll take a breather and go into, say, April and come back then with cooler heads. We'll see. But I, I, I think you're going to get both. You almost have to. Sure. They have been cutting now for about 18 months. That's right. And this is a good question for you, uh, Pauline, because you've been on both sides of the chamber, of course. Yeah. And my, my question is, as Richard mentioned, the House is going to wrestle with this first. 
Is there any input from Senate leadership when things are starting to get close about what they might be willing to entertain or not, or to let the House know that's just not going to fly on the Senate side of things? How, about, how much communication goes on there? There is a fair amount of communication when things get towards the end. Yeah. However, there'll be caucuses. I was caucus chair for four years in the House and chair of the Rules Committee. There are a lot of rules in the House. but. Richard is right, you know, they work it very differently. A lot more independence and a lot more freedom. Uh, for example, specifically, the speaker determines in the House where your committee, where your bills go. I mean, I was getting four committee referrals for all my ethics legislation. You're never going to pass a bill with that, even though I had s almost everybody in the House signing the ethics legislation. In the Senate, um, the majority leader if that's still how they do it. The majority leader determines, and you can go over or write a note and say, please this, send this bill to these two committees or whatever, because that's how they should be vetted in the committees that are related to the bills. Um, the compromises have to come, but sometimes there's a lot of, um, you know, I'm not going to do this, and you're going to have to listen to us, and it's a lot of this kind of thing. And then the governor gets involved. Sure. And he will have his, his people on the floor working both houses regarding the necessity. There's one major issue in this session. I, I was pleased to see he put in a few other things, you know, but there's the one major issue, and that's dealing with the deficit mm -hmm. because they have to balance the budget. Mm -hmm. How they're going to do it is really going to be an argument. I'm sure they'll start with the governor's framework. And the, a lot of the things that he said that would raise $400 million seemed quite acceptable to most everybody. And that's what usually happens. Everybody can agree on 85%, and then they fight very hard over the last 15%. And if they need to do it without the Republicans, I think they have numbers in both houses to do it. Let me, let me ask Rory about that. Thank you for that, uh, for that note. On Dan's point about Republicans standing firm, on, on, on uh, spending issues. Is there a way that Republicans can get on board, however? What can the House and Senate do to, and I know this is a highly detailed question and, and very unfair, but in general terms, is there something that can happen to get Republicans to come on board? Is there a line in the sand, so to speak? No, I think in this, this, this year, and given our current uh, economic uh, situation, uh, I think the, the, the lines are gonna be clearly drawn, and it's gonna be, a battle. Um, Dan and I have both been there and know that we're, you know, they're not going to win. But this is also an election year. Sure. Uh, and so consequently, those lines are become, going to become very important uh, to take a look at. And, you know, unfortunately, uh, I would have preferred had, you know, because we have been dealing with cuts and stuff over the last 18 months. One of the things that would have been nice would have been a special committee of Senate and House folks to go over to look at who is exempt from the gross receipts tax. How many different groups are out there? And should they really be? And could we, have, hey, could we have removed those exemptions and not raise the gross receipts tax? Wait, you know one of the biggest hmm. who's exempt? The media, the newspapers do not pay gross receipts tax unless they've changed it since they I left. But do they what? pay now? They don't. But but you know one of the things that you have to look at though <laughs> as well is is I think that this begs a bigger question that we probably don't have time to discuss today, Gene, right. which is, you know, it's our whole tax structure. Sure. I mean, we keep putting band-aids on bleeding arteries. What better time now than to look at this entire system? Our entire tax system in New Mexico is made up of exemptions. I mean, it's made up of who got the best lobbyists, went up there and got themselves carved out and got it done. <coughs> and, um, you know, I think when you talk about, um, you know, when Representative Eistad talks about they have the numbers, they have the numbers in Massachusetts too, but I don't think it's working out in their way to elect a Democrat to the U.S. Senate. So the point being that the numbers are there, but you have to look in the House. Um, you know, I, 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 would, I would argue that in theory there's a lot more rules. In practice, there's not. And in the Senate, I, I think Richard should be uh, credited. I think, you know, the, the process in the Senate is a lot more amicable. Um, you know, if somebody wants to exercise their individual power, a committee chair in the Senate and says, I'm not going to hear a bill, you know, they can pull that bill out of committee and get it to the floor and have a debate. That will never happen in the House. I mean, it if has. It, 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 it didn't happen in the 10 years that I was there. And you constantly heard about the sanctity of the committee process. So I, I think that you're going to see um, 
the point of this is at the very end is where do the Republicans play? They are the minority in the House. They are the minority in the Senate. I would argue they're really not the minority in the Senate. I think that there's there's two minorities. It's Republicans and Democrats in the Senate, and there's a majority of, of independent people that are working together right. to get things done. That Richard was a leader of that. Um, I think in the Senate, in the House, you do have Republicans and Democrats. But what happens is, is you have to remember the Speaker, who, who is king, you know, he, he has to control all of his folks as well. And you do that by not letting things pass. Well, as, as you've seen over the years, the Republicans get their strength in the last few days. The Republicans in the House, if they're willing to stand up and make the debates go for three hours on every bill, make the legislators sit there till four sure. or five in the morning, sure. that's when they start saying, okay, what are we gonna do? And I think a lot of this stuff isn't gonna get finished before the last day. I think if, if we start talking about ethics reform and we start talking about green energy and we start talking about oil and gas, before we go after this problem, which is the economic crisis facing New Mexico, you could wind up with a 30-day session that really doesn't solve much of anything. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, you have to keep in the balance. You know, you have had a very, very strong governor for seven years, probably one of the most powerful governors maybe ever in the history of New Mexico, who now has no power mm -hmm. and really isn't much help to getting people elected this next time. I mean, it's Bill Richardson is not going to be out raising money and stomping door to door for his reelection and his coattails are going to be very, very short. Mm -hmm. So you're going to start seeing some independence, I think, that could prevent this whole process from moving as smoothly as some but people think. is a lovely opportunity, it seems to me, mm -hmm. Richard, that, you know, you've got the ability for folks now to, to vote with their conscious, consciousness and, and, and their what's right for the people, what's right for our coffers, as opposed to all the other stuff that uh, Dan just mentioned. Seems like a brilliant opportunity. There is, but uh, keep in mind that most of our House seats, the ones that are up for election, all 70 of them, yeah. uh, are most of them are in uh, safe districts, so to speak. Safe Republicans, safe Democrat. There's really only five or six that are swing, and really the numbers, 45 to 25 in favor of the Democrats. Nothing's going to change. It's going to be really the gubernatorial race that I think people will be using ammunition to, 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 to focus on this election. Um, you know, the, during the budget process, there are some things that you can do to bring Republicans over. For example, you know, the one that I remember vividly because I was on a conference committee once is the 60 mile or 90 mile radius that uh, our universities have, particularly the ones on the border, uh, that allows out of state tuitions, in most cases, kids from Texas to come into New Mexico schools at in state tuition raise, uh, rates, which means that if you eliminate that, which mm. Republicans on the east side or around Las Cruces aren't going to want because they're going to lose a lot of students. They lose enrollment, they lose jobs. So that's going to be a pressure point that I know is used many times to get Republicans to agree to some compromise. And that's just one. There are others that you get Democrats maybe that are um, stuck on a particular issue that maybe you change a law, you change a, a, a budgeting process and it affects their community back home. So uh, it's it's not as difficult as it may seem. It just takes a long time. It's that old sausage making process sure. that we're sure. going to go through. But it'll be fun. And sure. you know what? They'll do their job and they will uh, they'll yeah, come out with a budget. Sure. I'll bet you 10 sure. years from now, New Mexico's still a state. I'll bet 10 years from now, New Mexico's still functioning. <laughs> right. I'll bet we still have a system of government. Sure. And I'll bet people like us will still be sitting around a table debating one so way or the other. That's right. That's right. That's right. 10 years ago, mm -hmm. one of the issues that was always used was pork. The capital projects, you know, the roads and all. And if there are, you know, that was a big, they used to always, and I think they still do, they would do the pork on the last day it would come for the vote. And everybody in the House would sit there like this. And in the Senate, they were concerned because one time we had uh, Senator Davis. Were you there when he did that? Filibuster. He filibustered and we didn't get pork that year. And everybody was so mad. But the next year we got the double amount because it was still in the severance tax bonds. And um, those are issues I don't think they're going to be able to maneuver with this year. Sure. There Which is I think no is pork. Give a lot of freedom to people. I think as you've talked sure. about, Gene, if if you're if you're sitting here thinking I got to toe the party line, Republican or Democrat, sure. it doesn't right. matter because I I don't want my leadership to carve me out of the pork. There's no pork. Right. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I think you may see some some more free spirits, and I think that you may see some more willingness to negotiate. Um, I, I, I kind of disagree with my, my friend Richard when you say that, you know, it's so solid in the House. It is. But if those six, let's just say those five seats swing Republican, mm -hmm. you're now at you're now at a 40-30, mm -hmm. which means there's going to be a few tweaking and we're getting ready to go into a redistricting deal. Mm -hmm. So you look at as we're coming up on redistricting, how many folks are going to be, you know, the pork doesn't exist right now, but redistricting does. I mean, I may not be able to tell you, Gene, I'm going to give you more pork for your school, 
but I can sure meet with you and tell you, Gene, I'm going to draw a district that That's you right. and Richard are going to be running against each other. Right. Now, if you'll vote right, I'll put Richard and Pauline together and I'll leave yeah. you alone. And I think you'll see some of that bartering going on. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, Richard kind of touched on it. The way it works is, you know, you, you, Republican or Democrat. I mean, when I was in leadership, I know when Rich was in leadership, we talked to people on both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. And uh, they do more talking than we do because they can actually deliver things and the Republicans really can't be in the minority party. But it's not uncommon for them to come across, the speaker to come across, pick three, four, five Republicans and say, look, you know, if you'll vote for this, this tax increase, we're going to maneuver money to finish the road project or the water project in Los Alamos, or we're going to do this down in, we're going to save the schools in Las Cruces, or we're going to do this for Eastern New Mexico University. And remember, all it takes is one. That's right. All it takes is one Republican for this whole Republican Democrat thing to falter on a campaign deal. If Richard can get one Republican to vote with him to raise a tax, and I go after Richard, Richard's answer is it's bipartisan. Sure. When I'm attacking Richard, Richard says, it's bipartisan. So I think you're going to see, as the as the elections roll around, you're going to see a real strong push from Republicans within the legislature, from the party apparatus outside the legislature, trying to say, you guys, you need to focus on what's important. And I think tonight's going to be a, a real big tell tale of, of where this is going. If, if the Kennedy seat goes Republican, I think you're going to see a lot of people uh, in, in New Mexico as well. I think the ripple effect is going to be, you know, what what's going to happen. Because at the end of the day, I think, you know, we could have a whole show, Gene, about the, the, the validity and if they even have any strength anymore of the parties in the system. Uh, you know, I mean, you look at the things that are being done by the Tea Party movement. I mean, there's a lot of independent movement out there. 51% sure. of the right, voters in Massachusetts are, are independent, independent right? which is amazing. Yeah. So I, I, I think yeah. the public really wants to see action yeah. and they want to see compromise and they want to see us solve the problem. Sure. They are not interested in the kinds of detail that we're discussing in terms of how you maneuver one and how you muscle the other. Mm -hmm. In the end, if, you, if the Republicans do nothing, then you will be perceived as doing nothing. You won't have helped to solve the problems, which are very severe. You won't have put yourself in, in, into the game. You're going to just sit on the sidelines and then start throwing arrows because the game wasn't solved. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. But I think it's a mistake because the problems exist. The compromise, I think that's what will happen. They'll do a, a little bit of spending cuts, a little bit of tax increases, and they'll try and patch it together till they can look at it more thoroughly, which I agree with you. Mm -hmm. Put together some kind of committee and give it some time to, sure. to really look at some of the tax structure. Last point to Rory. Well, you say that, but on the other hand, it's going to be very difficult in this recession, in this economics, to go look at a constituent at a town hall meeting or in a campaign and say, hey, I'm sorry, I raised your tax, your income tax by 1%. I think, I think or I, think or I, or I raised your tax. The Republicans is that they, they, we're not in this process, we're not in this problem because of Republican legislation or Republican leadership. We're in this problem because of Democrat legislation and Democrat leadership that Republicans fought spending increases over the years, that Republicans introduced legislation to do away with some of this stuff, that Republicans weren't on board for growing the state budget by 41.7%, that, that. That, that they were against it at that time. And I think now you're going to hear Republicans say, you know, the chickens are coming home to roost. Sure. And that's going to be for the constituents sure. to, to decide. Um, but I think you'll see some positive... Uh, opportunities for uh, uh, alternatives from Republicans. I, I really do. I mean, I, I think you will. I think, you know, I think Richard, again, deserves credit for, you know, creating a process in the Senate where, you know, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of the Senate that's really bipartisan. I mean, you'll be amazed at some of the, I mean, when you watch people like State Senator Rod Adair and State Senator Cisco McSorley working together on legislation, I mean, you just, you <laughs> have to go, wow, that's right. Examples. So, so I, I think, you know, I, I don't think the Republicans are going to say they're sure. not going to do anything, but I think the Republicans are going to say at the end of the day, you know, we've been warning you about this for the last seven years and what you do you know, want us to do now? We like, can't forget. We to, go ahead, last point it, it's a Give national problem. Sure. The national sure. problem, the national economy. You know, we wouldn't be in this difficulty unless we had the bank problems throughout the nation sure. and on the precipice of some kind of financial collapse. But I think your point a second ago is, is probably the point. The details yeah. are unimportant to the average constituent. Yes. It's results. Yes. People want to see results here. I want to thank you all for spending some time. I want to make sure the viewers know that I'm not being disrespectful by referring to these guys to just by their first names. I feel like I know all you guys so well that we just have a friendly chat about this. But Richard, Pauline, Rory, and Dan, thank you all for being here. Thank you, thank really you. appreciate it.